Thank you so much uh, for joining us. I'm delighted to be joined by Chandra, Noel, and Shamara. Now, what's at stake is really the future of our planet, and we need trillions of dollars to fund a green transition in emerging markets. Now, it's not only the future of our planet, but really it's emerging economies that are where the battle against climate change will be won or will be lost. So let's get straight to the panel. Um, Chandra, India was the biggest surprise or encouragement that we saw at Glasgow COP26. Will it accelerate the movement of finance? Will it actually change anything? Or was it happy talk that made people feel good about themselves, but actually th the money still needs to be deployed in the right way? I think um, the what we heard in COP26, overall net net, there are uh, a lot of positive things to take away, even though uh, everyone would have expected a um, little more concrete uh, commitment. Um, I think India made a commitment towards uh, uh, 2070, which is a, a significant commitment. Um, I would say it's very uh, aggressive commitment, mm -hmm. but achievable. Uh, also, what I like about the, about the Indian um, <coughs> commitments is also the 50% of our 500 uh, gigawatt target for the 2030 and 45% of the uh, reduction of the emissions. So there are goals for this decade while we are looking at uh, 2070. Coming to financing, there are uh, going to be a lot of challenges. It's not easy. Uh, I think the way to look at the financing is there are going to be projects right. which are very straightforward or which people are going to be very comfortable doing. Um, because there is a returns and business case, and there are going to be a lot of projects which are going to be high risk. Mm -hmm. And that has uh, two, three uh, difficulties. First is many of these uh, capital allocators look at emerging markets itself as a risk. On top of that, they would add the high risk projects risk, and they don't know how to, how to model it. Mm -hmm. The second one is when you look at the banking system in India, which is already stressed, and they're not going to be coming forward easily to uh, uh, do these kind of uh, projects. And the third one uh, is many of these projects are going to be uh, uh, pilots, especially you take hydrogen and so on and so forth. Uh, small projects, but they need to be tried out. Uh, somebody has to put money. It may not be large enough for, for, for big institutions to come in. Um, and others may find it too risky. So it's, yeah. we need to look at this carefully. But it's also a great way to actually look at some of the pilot schemes and maybe be able to import them elsewhere. Um, Jamara, the pandemic, of course, has mobilized this unprecedented amount of public resource. At the same time, you have an increased amount of wanting some of these you know, sustainable investments. Can you have sustainable infrastructure investments at the heart of these recoveries? What are some of the opportunities you're seeing? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, but certainly what we found, and Michael Bloomberg mentioned the COP session, is that awareness has now increased phenomenally since the first COP over the last 26 COPs uh, amongst young people, which is great to see, um, but also amongst the private sector. So I think we had double the amount of attendees expected, 25,000 people, and big commitments have been made by private sector organisations as well. And I think the estimate now is that we are heading towards 1.9 degrees instead of 2.7 if those commitments are met. Uh, but the challenge is the solutions to enable people to deliver on those commitments, and particularly in emerging markets where, um, you know, 65% of the emissions are from non-OECD countries, and it's really as these countries industrialise and lift living standards that the bulk of emissions in the world are going to be driven. But unlike developed nations, we're asking them to undertake that journey without using fossil fuels and the carbon emissions we had. So there's certainly a lot of capital now that has committed from the private sector to net zero by various states, 30, 2030, 40, 2050. Um, but I think the challenge really is now converting that into solutions. And particularly, you know, as Chandra was saying, in the emerging markets, there are a range of challenges because that huge pool of private capital, not just CFLI, but the uh, Mark Carney has been leading this Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. Um, Noel's also involved in this. There are, um, I think, Noel, about 450 banks from 45 countries that speak for 130 trillion. And Michael Bloomberg, very pleasingly, has stepped up to be co-chair of that. 
which is going to give it even more impetus. But there's a huge pool of money there ready to commit. The problem is it's looking after the funds of pensioners and retirees and savers that is looking for low risk, moderate return investments. And the challenge we have in emerging markets in terms of creating this sustainable infrastructure for their pathways is de-risking that capital. So we need a lot of work between governments, the multilateral development banks, the private sector to create frameworks to attract these large pools of investment. And I might stop there for now and um, you know get some comments from others, but um, that's something we can explore further on this panel. Yeah, and I guess no. You know, the optimist will say this is a huge amount of money that's being, you know, put to work in a good way. The less optimists say, well, first it's not mandatory, so actually it's very, you know, we don't know exactly what happens to this money. And if you look at the, the unprecedented demand for some of these green investments, actually did not reduce emissions. So, what role does finance have to play? So, Francine, it, it, I'd, I'd like to pick up on Shamara's comments and say, let's go to the next level of detail, because there are so many words out there, blended finance, combination of public and private sector yeah. finance. Let's try and decompose that. Let's take a mitigation project, a new source of energy, hydrogen, a new source of transportation, energy, sustainable aviation fuel. That technology, I think, is coming, and it's sort of beyond the research and development phase. It's now getting ready for scale. But to put the finance in there, it probably needs a combination of factors. It needs a very strong demand signal from governments. Mm -hmm. And I think what India said at COP26 is a very strong demand signal. The energy mix of India is changing, so the private and the public sector can get their head around that and start to think about an alternative market. What then may need to happen is to get the financing in place, private sector finance, whether it's equity or debt, is some help from public sector financing to create some of the, the cost of some of those energy sources are gonna be beyond the payback cycle that would normally, one would expect from the private sector. So there may be a need for governments also to provide some form of temporary, whether it's for five or 10 years or three years, financing support through subsidies out of their tax revenues to put some support in those early days because those projects are not at an economic level. And then I think you've got the ability for the private sector to come in mm -hmm. and then provide equity and debt to complete that picture because you've got a business case then that is financeable, but it needs a combination of that. Now, when you then say do that in the developing market, in some developing markets there's additional risk, which is maybe political risk or country risk and currency risk. And that's where I think the role of the MDBs can come into play because they can take some risks that the private sector can't take or any one country can't take. So I'm, you know, I, I, when I look at blended finance as a phrase, I say, so what does it really mean? It really means a combination of government policy, yeah. maybe some government funding, plus some private sector equity, private sector debt, and possibly some MDB support for those risks the private sector can't take. Yeah. And we've got to get into that detail. And you think, Chandra, first of all, what would you be asking you know, governments of something that you need to be, to be sure that actually a lot of the investments go towards sustainability and what works? I mean, if we look at precise examples that then we can you know, export somewhere else, what do you see that has been a success? I think, I think the first thing is uh, we need a systematic approach between um, rating agencies, banks, market regulators, and government policy makers, so that we have a proper way of looking at any project in climate financing, the risk. Otherwise, there are a lot of different interpretations, a lot of different definitions, and that needs to come in place. And also, the standard that was agreed to be adopted, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's called ISSB um, in Glasgow, I think that will help. Um, so that is one thing that we need to put in place. The second thing is, I think while there will be a lot of private financing and capital available, but it cannot be done without public financing, whether it is government uh, supported or multilateral organizations, because 
as I said, many of these projects that we are uh, uh, wanting to do, uh, I'm not talking about the utility scale, renewables, solar. I mean, these are things which are very proven, which have, um, which have a method of, uh, uh, of getting finance. But many of the other projects, whether it is um, hydrogen or, or any other new technology, especially for heavy industries like steel, cement, etc., have to be uh, supported. For that, the mechanism has to be worked out and clarity has to be brought in. I think that's... Uh, and then also there are incentives that are required. Currently, there is no incentive for even uh, for companies who are doing these projects to, uh, to even report, even to compute and report all the climate metrics. There's nothing that this forces them or there's no uh, incentive. So governments should come out with um, incentives for these people to uh, report on these metrics. Shamar, is there anything that you think should be mandatory and, and that you know, has a high chance of actually becoming mandatory? Well, I actually think the glide path has to be tailored for every country to suit the particular country. So um, in the case of India, and it's fantastic that um, Bloomberg New Energy has taken this initiative to get the Climate Finance Leadership Group focusing on India as a pilot, because I think if we can get things done in India, we can use that as a pilot to catalyze other countries, but they will have their own tailored glide path. So in terms of what India makes mandatory, it's got to be tailored to India. India has chosen solar as a big part of its glide path and has stepped up the 400 gigawatt target to a 500 gigawatt and has done 100 already. And as Chandra said, probably solar is now at a scale where the private sector can do it without government support. What the government can do, maybe instead of necessarily making things mandatory, is create encouragement, as Noel said, with things like incentives. Um, and so if hydrogen is to be the area creating offtake and demand because getting projects at scale is important and use cases are important, or um, you know, the UK government, for example, in terms of now catalyzing wind and having 50% of the offshore wind capacity in the world <coughs> installed capacity started with a contract for difference regime. So it doesn't actually have to be forcing things and making a mandatory. It can be a little bit of encouragement where the government uses its smaller balance sheet than the private sector to catalyze private sector investment by de-risking early stage. And then once things are de-risked, can basically exit those positions, let the private sector run with it as it could now with solar projects, and then reinvest that capital. Um, so yes, there's carrot and stick. and. Um, we found the carrot has been a good incentive to get private sector going, but um, it has to very much, in the case of what we're doing with the India pilot, be tailored for India because we're not looking to do this to India, we're looking to do it with India and fit in with not just the government's priorities, but there are a lot of Indian corporates now, like Tata Group, getting on with projects across not just energy, but electrification of transport, heavy industry, steel, cement, those are exciting places um, for private capital to come and invest with partners where you may not even need involvement, mandatory or otherwise, from government. No? Let me give you, let me take one project, and I, I just looked at this one a bit more closely. There's some other, some other projects in sustainability, <coughs> sustainable aviation fuel. If every country in the world made a statement that they required the, any airline operating in those countries to have at least 10% SAF, in their fuel mix by 2030, that creates a market. Yeah. Now, you could say, well, any airline alone should want to do that. Well, if some do and some don't, there's a big price difference between SAP and kerosene. So the airlines that do are disadvantaged. But if every country mandates that, you've created a market. Now, is that sufficient <laughs> for private sector to build the refineries with equity and debt? Probably not enough yet, because SAF is still more expensive than kerosene, because it's not yet got the cost curve of solar and wind. So probably there's an element, for, to make that business case viable, there's probably an element for governments to also redistribute some of the ETS money into those projects and direct it in to subsidize the cost curve in the build-out period. If both of those things happen, I have no doubt the equity would build the refineries and the debt would be there to fund the build of the refineries. I have no doubt. So what's the hardest? Is it the political courage? I think the yeah. hardest move is that political first move because then you create the market conditions. 
Some projects will need that second component, no. some won't. Wind and solar does not need that second component. The private sector can fund wind and solar now. There is a, a, a further component. In certain countries, if you're building that plant in certain developing markets, you've also got a currency risk that can't be managed by the private sector, or you've got a political risk that can't be managed by the private sector, and maybe that's where you do need NDV to supplement. Now, you could pick hydrogen, you could pick carbon capture, you could pick nuclear. It doesn't matter what the project is. There's going to be a combination of those elements that are going to make a project successful, or it won't yet happen. Uh, and I think that, for me, is the definition of blended finance. I mean, we're trying to give concrete solutions. So, Chandra, is there either a project that was very successful or actually that failed that would be a, a good you know, case study to see what we can do better and more of? Yes, but before that, can I comment on a couple of points based on the comments made by Shamaran Noel? <clears throat> See, I think this offtake is a very, very important point that Shamaran made. When you do these kind of projects, which are, uh, which are new projects, and people will put in money if there is a committed offtake. Yep. But it's easily said than done. And the, the biggest challenge is that the amount of money that is required and the commitment made by the, the developed nations, that 100 billion per year, that's not happening. So we need certainty to, certainty to that kind of money to flow because um, if you look at India, while I said uh, that it's a very aggressive goal but it's achievable, if India has to achieve the 2070 target, between now and 2070, the total carbon emission will be 220 billion. Uh, tons. That is going to be the uh, target. But that is still half of what the US has so far, yeah. till today, how much it has emitted. And still it is less than the total emission from China. So people will argue, if you're going to ask a developing country to take on more, uh, to cut faster, the development of the 1.3 billion people will suffer. So you've got to find a solution. So how do you find it? Where do you find the money? So that, that, see, that, is, that, that is why I think we've got to figure out a way of supporting these technology projects, whether it is aviation fuel or whether it is hydrogen or, uh, or any other. For Yesterday we were in another panel, which Mike was running, where there was, a, there was an entrepreneur from Singapore who talked about the difficulty to find money for a maritime, maritime shipping pilot. So we need to figure out a way of uh, getting some public finance um, into, into these kind of projects and then figure out a way of offtake. Offtake is a very critical element. The moment we can sign up the offtake, whoever is the users, uh, I mean, it is happening in the battery industry. Battery is a very classic example. There are a lot of uh, all OEMs, auto OEMs are going towards uh, electrification and all of them need batteries. And most of the battery contracts or plants they are putting in there is a definitive offtake commitment that's being made by the OEM for the next 10 years, and without which this project is not happening. And that is why the battery is happening much faster now. So similarly, here the nature of the beast is tougher because we are trying to handle all industries at the same time. So we've got to figure out, uh, figure out the initial funding as well as the offtake. Shamara, where do you see the money coming from? How much more can actually private companies do? I mean, they seem to be leading the charge. Is there a way to, you know, catalyze the public space? Um, catalyzing the public space really is ultimately in the hands of the governments and the MDBs. Um, and as Chandra was saying, you know, there are ways the governments can use their money in a very smart way to do things like create use cases. For example, um, you know, in hydrogen, getting scale is really important to bring down the cost of a project. So, yes, you need to bring electrolyzer cost down. Yes, you need cheap renewable but you also need a scale project. Um, things like long haul transport, you know, mining equipment, et cetera, replacement of diesel with hydrogen, they're great use cases. So I think the government can use its money intelligently there. And, you know, we're a big investor in infrastructure and we've certainly seen many governments around the world in developing countries um, access massive pools of private capital by creating a range of de-risked projects early on where people get confidence in investing in that particular economy. And then the private capital starts to flow. 
Um, I do think there's extra challenges, as Noel was saying, in terms of there are scale technologies like solar and wind, trying to get the emerging ones um, to um, compelling cost points where they become the default choice of rational actors in the market. In a developing market is harder because there are all sorts of issues like country risk, et cetera, that push up the cost of capital. So it's almost easier to bring these things down to um, com competitive costs in developed markets and then roll out the technologies in the developing markets. Um, having said that, you know, companies like Tata probably can bring projects of enough scale where that capital can flow to a Tata project, perhaps to get things going rather than um, necessarily an Indian one. So, no, how much do you need to de-risk to actually get, you know, projects flowing more? Yeah, there are some projects that need to be de-risked. And, and, and listen, I, was, I remember some of our early financing of wind and solar. Um, I've been in banking long enough where I can remember the early ones. And there were offtake agreements in place. And some of those projects were in developed markets. And governments decided to change those contracts partway through. Um, you know, that's the definition of political risk that's hard for the private sector to cope with. And it undermined the wind and solar sector for quite a while because you had a, a market framework that the private sector thought was going to operate for 10 and 15 years, and it changed. Now, that's the sort of thing that the private sector can't cope with. And, you know, we, I remember two projects, we lost money on them because the contract terms changed midstream. Um, now, that's what we need to avoid in creating unnecessary risk. If we want to really crowd in private sector finance, there's a role for the private sector, and they'll do it. We played our role, are still playing our role. But it needs to operate within a context, and that's the context that I think governments need to, to set. And I think the move by India recently is an absolutely important first move. I think the technology's there. There's enough brain power and will to create the financing structures but it needs dialogue between public and private sector. But no, just so I understand, so if you de-risk, I mean, this would be because basically no government, because you have a risk in a country, whether it's for green investment or not. So this is de-risking because the, the population absolutely needs a project like this. But also, let's be realistic. Hydrogen is probably going to have a unique cost of energy production for the next 10 years. That's going to be two or three times the cost of energy production of fossil fuels. So it's not just a case of de-risking the technology or de-risking the build, um, but the, the offtake agreement for that right. energy source is going to have an inherent cost that the consumers of the world probably don't want to pay for at the moment. Now, the question is, does that get passed on to the consumers or do government step in and try and perform some subsidies to mitigate that early unit cost? It took wind and solar 25 years to get a unit cost of energy to match the unit cost of today's energy source. We can't afford for 25 years worth of evolution in hydrogen, in SAF, in carbon capture, in other energy sources. We have to find a mechanism to get those technologies up, knowing they're going to cost more at a unit cost level than existing sources, and we've got to get them into scale. Chandra, I mean, this goes back to the financing, right? To do this, you need money from, yeah. from somewhere. <clears throat> So I'll, I'll give some examples. See, you take our uh, group itself. We, um, we are doing a lot on renewable energy, solar, and we are getting enough financing. A lot of private capital available. And in fact, uh, many people want to invest because the cost of uh, the whole project itself has come down. And if you take the purchase uh, agreements from the government, uh, pretty much uh, it is in sync with, it's the same level as the... Uh, um, coal power. Um, it has become attractive over the last few years. We also are uh, getting into electric vehicles in a big way. We we got a very uh, uh, very important deal done with TPG uh, Climate Fund uh, a couple of uh, two three weeks ago for for a billion dollars. So this again, there's a lot of money available for the right kind of projects which are proven, which is going to require a lot more capital because we're going to do batteries and so on and so forth, but the money will be coming. But we are also doing projects like uh, we produced uh, the first set of uh, hydrogen-based commercial vehicles. Uh, and if you look at those projects, still the economics uh, 
I think uh, Noel was saying, economics doesn't work out. But it's a high risk project at this point in time. But I'm pretty sure oh, as we go into the next three, four, five years, things will change. So how do you create a framework for, see, because, uh, because it's, it's, a, it's a, in the overall scheme of things, it's a project that we could fund, we have funded. But let's say if the same project and same technology has to be developed by mm -hmm. a startup or an NGO or somebody else, it's going to be very hard for them to get the finance. But we need more people working on it. Otherwise, innovation will not happen. So we need the technology. We use the technology, but we really uh, look for technologies. So many people want to do these pilots, for example, uh, solid state batteries. Uh, because the projects are way out, 28, 2030, and so on and so forth. So there are certain class of projects where we still have to figure out, and I'm pretty sure that uh, CFLI which Mike has set up on my, uh, me and Shavara are working. We are going to be having quite a lot of fun over the next 12 months to find solutions and find some of these <laughs> pilot projects and figure out a way to fund them. I mean, three, four, five years, you're quite optimistic. Shamara, do you share that optimism? I'm actually, where do you see the most appetite from investors? Hey, can I say one thing? Yeah. I think it is my personal belief that all dates with respect to climate commitments will be quicker. There will be more pressure to bring it forward. Pressure from who? Public. Do you agree it with that? It will happen. Younger people will want you to okay. go faster. So we need to innovate. Uh, it's hard, but we need to innovate. We need to get more technology, better technology, better cost structures. Mm -hmm. this, yeah. this will be a movement. This yeah. will happen. Yeah. Shamar, do you, do you agree first on the timeline, that actually the timelines that we're working yeah. on now could be maybe halved? Or is that too oh, optimistic? I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> don't be too aggressive. No. <laughs> so, uh, I don't want to agree with you, Chandra, that basically what we have done in terms of this CFLI India commitment that we've all made, all of us on the panel, is that um, we are going to make this happen. Yeah. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to identify a few pilot projects and get on with it. So we're talking a lot now with the multilateral development banks. We're going to pick a few priority areas. We've talked about areas like the circular economy, hard to abate industrial sectors, enabling infrastructure like the grid, um, et cetera, electrification of transport. Um, but I think what we need to do from here now is get together. We've got a whole lot of domestic global Indian partners lined up and international investors. We need to, between us now, start identifying those projects, work with the MDBs on how we're going to de-risk them, get a few of them done. So we've set ourselves a target in two years to get a couple of pilot projects done, uh, where hopefully the government will also um, come to the party and understand that by delivering consistently, to the point Noel was making earlier about private capital getting unnerved if the rules of the game change, if you keep the rules of the game consistent, we need to you know, get the governments appreciating that's in their long-term interest because it creates confidence and really catalyzes a lot of private money at a lower cost of capital. So I think between all of us, we're very committed, having taken this on, to getting a few of these pilot projects done so that we can prove up that they can get done. And I hear what Noel says about costs coming down, but frankly, they're coming down faster and faster. Yep. You know, look at what we did with uh, vaccines in relation to COVID. It took solar, I think, 10 years to drop really? to one tenth of its cost. It's taken batteries two years to do that, just on Bloomberg New Energy data. So, um, you know, I, I'm basically committed to getting on with this, with us as a group, and getting a few pilot projects done and catalyzing um, more capital investment to India and making that a pilot for other emerging markets. I, I would agree 100% with that. I, I, I think the cost curve of wind and solar will not be the cost curve we see on some of the new technologies, because I think the weight of the world is now behind this. You know, wind and solar, you could argue, led the way, and the weight of the world wasn't behind wind and solar. But there is so much momentum and uh, amongst the private sector and the public sector. I think we're going to learn a lot faster. And therefore, the cost curve won't be a 25-year cost curve. It'll be a lot faster. But the most important thing, I, I spoke to somebody recently about a project. I said, we can, plan f we can plan for 10 years from now, and I know you need 14 plans. But why don't we just do the first one? Let's get it up, run in, learn in. And, and, you know, that's, I think, what we've got to do. We've got to bring some of these technologies to scale, not ultimate scale, but let's bring some of them to scale, get it financed, get it up there, and we'll all learn a huge amount in the process. 
Shamar, do you think there are enough projects? I mean, one of the things that sometimes investors say is that there are actually few bankable low carbon companies and projects available in some of the emerging markets. And so how much of a concern and setback will that be? No, you're exactly right that it's not just um, the policy and regulatory frameworks and the, the MDB money to de-risk, it's the pipeline of projects and the expertise as well that you need to get this all going. But that's why it's fantastic to have a company like Tata involved because, you know, I talked to Chandra and you could go through it, Chandra, there's no end of projects there in terms of solar panels, solar pumps, electrification of transport, um, you know, steel and cement, the things that are going on there. So. Um, I think we will probably go to some of the corporates as well to identify buy a few scale pilot projects that we can use. I call them bell cars. I think it's an Australian expression that we can get others to follow um, if we can prove these up. So we don't need a thousand projects. We just need a handful of very good high prospectivity of conversion projects. Um, in other places, you know, like the UK wind, they had a massive pipeline to catalyze the industry. But I think for India, if we can get a few of these, um, you know, big bell cow projects done, that will be enough for the pipeline to try and accelerate movement in India and the rest of the world, hopefully. But having a few, does it still mean that, you know, we're a way off having the sustainable capital market scale that we need? But I'll make three or four quick points. First is that I, I'm, I'm glad that, uh, you know, I want to thank Mike for taking this leadership. And also I'm very glad that he chose India. And as Shamara said, um, she and I are, are understand what, what needs to be done in terms of uh, the number of projects that we are going to find, and difficult ones, and how to, not the standard ones, some of the offbeat ones. We have got a very good board, which we have formed. So uh, we are working towards getting it done. That's one. The second point I said is, in terms of the projects, there are uh, many, many, many areas in which we can do projects. There are projects in carbon capture we can do. There are projects in um, hydrogen. There is, a, there is a project in terms of how do you change the park, that is, the number of existing commercial vehicles and, that are running on, on the road for the last 20 years, and how do you replace them? There are special projects that you can do. There are projects in uh, recycling. There are many, many different areas of sustainability we need to address. I am sure that we will find uh, people who do those projects, and we've got to work on coping them. We've got to help them find the right, mm -hmm. uh, right financing. And that's a job to do. If you ask me uh, whether we know exactly what we're going to do, no, the details are to be worked out. But I think uh, once the project is proven, I think for scaling, finance will be available. But it's not only private capital. There has to be uh, multiple different forms. I think uh, you, you articulated it up front. No? I, I think this is a, a great conversation to prove how important it is that today's industries, today's corporates, are behind that transition and are instrumental in the transition. Because you can't do this through a bunch of SPVs alone. It's today's industrial base, today's companies that have the technological ability, that have the market access, that have the people that understand how to get projects into scale, that those businesses are behind this transition. And we, the finance community, finance those businesses to facilitate that transition. I don't think you can compartmentalize this into companies that are green and companies that are brown. And the world will change purely by companies that are pure green. 90% of the world is in complex organizations, the industrial base of the world. And it's the 90% that has to transition to, to, to the green world. And, and we've got to leverage their skills and capabilities, their borrowing capability, their project management credibility. That's what we've got to leverage. We're almost out of time, but I'm going to ask you each in 30 seconds. Shamar, I'm going to start with you. If you look at CFLI India, what is the one thing that you think we should take as a model for future public-private partnership? Something that is really working at the moment. It's just getting going, but I think it is this collaboration between government, the private sector, and the MDBs, and having you know, a really targeted plan 
Um, and I should just briefly say, Francine, that even though I've said Tata's got a lot of projects, Chandra's been very clear he wants other Indian corporates to step up as well with good projects. So it's a collaboration, I think, and the focus and the support we're getting from um, Bloomberg as well has been phenomenal, having the commitment from Bloomberg, GFANS, all of these various global partners. Nolan, 30 seconds, is there something in this partnership that you could replicate in terms of model? I as ever, on making anything new happen, the devil's in the detail, and you've got to work the detail. Um, and then, once you've done that, it will become a reality. Sandra? I think it's the collaboration, the framework, getting everybody together and finding those difficult projects and figure out how to risk them, how to quantify the risk, so that we can get the capital in. So we will, that's what we have to figure out. We'll Great. figure it out. So let's redo this conversation in six months to see where we are. Thank you so okay. much for a very robust conversation. Pleasure.